what could an app do? What would make it valuable? Here's the thing about books. And I'm focused, Brain Bump is focused on business books, self-help books, not so much fiction or biography, but we can talk about what those need to do in the future. But let's just look at business and self-help. With these books, you read a book, you say, okay, this is great, this is so useful, but then you forget it two weeks after you finish the book. Not helpful. And in fact, where did you read the book? Probably sitting on your couch. Where do you need to use the book? Probably somewhere else. I have networking tips in my book. You don't use those networking tips on your couch. You're probably using them when you're out at an event. So the problem is books are disconnected spatially and temporally from when we need the content within them. That's a problem. Now we want people to remember what's in them and we know there's a proven technique for doing this called space repetition. It's a fancy name for open your book again before the test. And that's what we did in school. We'd reread the book, we'd look at our notes, we'd use flashcards. But no one does that for books they read. I happen to take notes on books I read, but I'm kind of different that way. But I even rarely look back at them. So I thought, what if we could take the key ideas in the book, the highlights, key tips, put those into an app that's in your pocket. This makes the content accessible to the user when and where they need it. Now, even then, they might not think to access it. So my networking tips, they might think, I'm walking into a networking event, let me open the app, pull up Mark's tips, great, and you get just in time, perfect. Okay, welcome to the podcast. We're gonna have an interesting conversation today with my guest. We're gonna be talking about writing a book, promoting a book, all that great stuff, which we do here all the time on Living the Next Chapter, but we're also gonna jump over and talk about this amazing app that uh, Mark is here to share and and give us a sneak peek about and let you know if you haven't heard about this, you're going to want this app in your life because it's going to help you curate content and feed you what you want in life. Mark is here with all the answers. Mark, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show today. It's excellent. So Mark, tell us a little bit about, first of all, where you are in the world. I always love to, to hear that. I'm based right in Midtown of New York City. Beautiful. Wow. Okay, great. So yeah, I'm up here in Canada. So we we wave at you from from the great up north up here. Um, tell me a little bit about your background, Mark. Tell me a little bit about what you've done and and uh, what uh, what excites you in life right now. I have kind of a diverse background. I came out of MIT back in the '90s, and I started out as a software engineer. I've spent most of my career building tech startups. I've been in traditional startups, sometimes as small as three people. I've helped Fortune 500s play startup. But I've also, in parallel, spent time in academia. I helped start teaching programs at MIT, even Harvard Business School. And that came about because when I was going through my career, I realized there were a number of skills I needed that no one taught me. Things like negotiating, networking, leadership. I developed them in myself and quickly realized I wanted to upskill my team along with me. As I was learning them, it was good for my team to learn them. And as I did this, I got pulled into MIT to develop a course to help teach this to the next generation of MIT students. That put me on unexpected path in parallel to building tech startups. That path led to my book, The Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You, and then got me to be on podcasts, to be a media figure, a thought leader, and of course led to the app that we're gonna talk about. So I've had these parallel careers that have diverged and then converged of late. Okay, that's okay. There's so much to talk about right away. I love it. Um, so Mark, tell us a little bit about the why behind the book, which I love that you have just beside you there on the shelf. That's great. Tell me a little bit about the why behind it and who the audience is intended to be for that book. If you think about what it takes to be successful, you need to know your domain whether it's being a podcast host or an accountant, a salesperson, engineer, we go to school and we learn technical skills. I don't just mean software or STEM. It might be those accounting skills or marketing skills, but we also know there are these other skills, leadership, team building, communications, networking, negotiating, all these skills. We've heard about them. We know they're important, but no one actually sat us down 
and taught us these skills. They just assume we somehow magically pick it up along the way. That's not a good recipe for success. At MIT, we recognized we're here to teach our students. If we teach them even a little, we can put them on a much better track for success. And so that's why we created what's now referred to as MIT's Career Success Accelerator. For years, I've been teaching there for over two decades, I encourage them to take the content, put it online, because MIT, of course, led the way for online courseware. We gave away our content long before anyone else, or to share it with other universities. And for various reasons, just because we didn't have the time and resources to really commit to that, it never happened. So I thought, let me write up some of the notes from the class, things that we could share. But what I thought would be 20 pages of notes became a 200 plus page book. <laughs> and when that happened, I said, okay, well, you know, it's a book, let's put it out there and go through the whole publishing and book promotion path. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. So from your perspective, as an educator, as a thought leader in, in your area, what are you seeing that's exciting when your students come and sit in front of you and, and that whole track? Is there something that's lighting you up? Is there something different about today's students that you're seeing? There is certainly a, a trend that is always changing. I saw the rise of the millennials. We could see behavioral patterns in them. We saw the millennials basically pass through college and now we're into Gen Z. Gen Z has only just started and we've been remote for two years. So yeah. there was a little bit of challenge there. So I don't think I have a handle on them yet, but we do see these trends and changes. And certainly one of the challenges we're seeing today is the students who are growing up do so, so digital first. When I was a kid, my mom would say, it's a nice day out, go outside and play. And then you walk over to a friend's house and you knock on the door and, you know, is Chris here? Does Chris want to come out and play? And yeah. we just kind of figured things out. But today's kids, they're online and they can find others online. They communicate online and they don't necessarily develop the same in-person social skills. So there are studies suggesting they may be a little weaker today. Now it's questionable. Maybe this will be the new trend. And in fact, people just prefer to interact this way. And maybe that's not a problem. We suspect it might be because humans for literally tens of thousands of years have interacted in person. But so our classes are trying to help people address building some of these skills in the professional workplace. And you asked earlier, who is it for? It's really anyone who says, I want to get better at leadership. I wish I was better at networking. I want to be a better negotiator. The book itself, it's a little different than other books. 10 chapters, 10 skills, they each stand alone. So my readers can pick up the book and say, I just want to get better at networking. Jump right to chapter eight, skip the first seven, and just go right into those skills. It's designed, I called it the career toolkit, because it's designed like a toolkit, pick up the tool you need, use it, grab another when that's appropriate. So this is a book that you're not gonna read once and put it on the shelf and never refer to again. This is something that's meant to be used, again, another tool in your toolkit. So I like, that's a great, great analogy, I love that. Thank you, and that was Forbes assessment, assessment as well. It's a book you read over and over, not necessarily cover to cover, but you can pick it up and say, I need to brush up on these skills. And each chapter, it's very concrete. It's very much, here's what you're gonna learn. Let's talk about how to think about it, and then concrete specific things you can do to get better, better at it. And then there are next steps if you wanna go further, both in the book and on the website. But yeah, exactly. It's something you come back to when you need it. So, this is interesting because I'm going to lead you down a path in, in our time together, Mark. But you're an author, a published author, and you get to the end of the process. You have the book in your hand, and now it's time to get out there and share it with the world. I've been chatting with other authors on this podcast. They've come to the recording time, maybe for the first time ever on a podcast. They're new at promotion. They don't know where to start. They don't know how to build community around their book which they're passionate about, and they're trying to reach that community. From your perspective as an author, was it difficult to build community around what you had written, or did you have a community already in place that was eager to, to get your book in their hands? 
it's not difficult, but it's also not easy. Okay. And the reason I say that I have a background from all the startups I've done, I've done online marketing. I was at one company where we had a mailing list and I would oversee the sending out of literally 600 million emails a year. Now, Whoa. these were opt-in emails, just to be clear, I'm not a spammer. Yeah. But I've been in those businesses. I've been in lead generation businesses. I understand SEO. So I've had a lot of training that's made easy for me, but it's years of training is what got me here. And not everyone has that. The key thing to remember, and this comes from my friend, Robin Colucci, who advises people on books. When you create a book, it is a marathon, not a sprint. Because so many people think, okay, I'm doing the book and boy, that that's a real drag. That's the writing it and editing it and going over. And we know what that can be like. And you get the writer's block and all the things. And finally you say, okay, I think I'm there. And you give it to your editor. Go, okay, good. It's in their hands now. And you wait and wait. And so many authors say, okay, now I've got the book in my hands. And now we've got the launch party. And we're there. We're done. I hit the finish line. That's the starting line. Mm-hmm. That's the starting line for the yeah. second race you're running. Mm-hmm. And that's what most people don't think about. When I got my book, when I got the first copy of it, the early copy, so many authors talked about this is a moment they felt really excited. Honestly, I felt nothing. I did not have that, oh, here it is, it's real. I just felt, okay, check another milestone in a very long list of things to do because I knew you have to do at least as much work promoting your book as creating it. So did you have a a strategy in mind then as far as where you would find your audience to start promoting? Like, did you have a social platform or through website, through email? What was kind of your first uh, attempts at, at getting your message out about your book? Now, let me set some background. I had modest social media presence. I had on LinkedIn probably around 2,000 connections. And these were all people I knew personally. I don't connect to strangers on LinkedIn. So those were all people I knew. I had maybe about the same on Facebook. Again, personal connections. I had no Instagram, no Twitter, didn't use those. And even my posts on Facebook were primarily confined to friends or friends of friends. So I didn't have a big social media following. I had no email list. So I was starting kind of from scratch. All I did have was a good network that I had built up over years. When I launched, I did spend money on a press release. That's the one thing I did. I put out a press release and that got picked up by a couple people and led to some opportunities. But other than that, I started going through my network. Now I'm fortunate to have developed a good network over the years. I had people, for example, who would get me into Forbes or get me into other places that were premier names that interviewed me, that wrote about the book and got some early publicity. And then I pounded the pavement and I went on 300 podcasts in about 18 months to go out and promote my book. And that's just, it's work, it's effort. Once you figure out how to do it, it's not that hard, but you have to do it yourself or pay someone to do it. Mm -hmm. Likewise, I have social media posts every day. I have blog posts that come out every week and it's just, it's effort. It's daily, regular effort you put in, you can do it yourself, you can pay someone else to do it, but it needs to get done. And then you start building that community and, and then that starts to pay off for you. And that's, that's the one part I think that, again, a lot of the authors that I speak to, it seems like, like you mentioned the finish line, they get to the finish line, the book is done and they think everything else should just happen naturally on its own. But I love that you're saying your finish line is your starting line. That's a, that's a great visual. You know, in my world of tech startups, we always hear about the big success stories. Facebook, eBay, Google. Oh, this is a story. And they do documentaries on them. And we learn about how they did things. And it's told kind of magically with rose-colored glasses. What you don't hear about is the company that went out And the founder struggled for two and a half years without taking a salary. And then they raised a little money. They maybe raised three, four million dollars. And after a couple years, it kind of went nowhere. And the company shut down and you never heard of them. 
and you never will. And that's most startups. Most startups are not PayPal or some other big company you've heard of. There are these tiny ones you never heard of that went nowhere. But we only see the success stories. So we have a bias towards thinking, well, this is how it happens. Mm -hmm. And it all magically somehow works out. Likewise with the books, you see bestsellers. Now, a bestseller might be, well, Stephen King is putting out his hundredth book and it's instantly a bestseller. Or it might be someone else puts out a book, a first time author, but she or he maybe has the right connections or good PR or just happened to be the right book in the right place and jumps right to the charts. And that's what we see. We don't talk about that person who spent three years writing her book and then it came out and she had the launch party and got her friends and sold 50 copies and that went nowhere. Mm -hmm. And she'd struggle and struggle and maybe sold a book a week. You don't hear about that, but that's the majority of cases. And that's what we need to talk about and understand. This is what's likely going to happen. And we look at the success stories thinking, what can we learn from that? And there are lessons, but let's not undercount how much luck paid a factor or how much their status, their connections, their what they've done in the past, something you can't replicate, played a key factor. So that leads us down a pathway, which uh, I would love to kind of chat about. I'm on this new app. Yeah, I don't know if you heard about this. It's uh, called Brain Bump. I'm actually on it right now. And um, uh, it's a really great app. I don't know. Have you heard anything about this? It's pretty cool. I have indeed, because yeah. this came out of all my experience promoting my content. Let me give you the background for it. I was talking to my neighbor one day, and she said, you should build an app for your book. I said, okay, great. What should the app do? I don't know, but you should build an app. Great. Thanks. So helpful. Why don't you just tell me you should be a bestseller? Okay, I'll put that <laughs> on a to-do list. So I started thinking about what could an app do? Now, the early book apps were simply taking a PDF, wrapping it as an app, and people could download. No one wants to do that anymore, and why would you? You can get everything on Kindle. But what could an app do? What would make it valuable? Here's the thing about books. And I'm focused, Brain Bump is focused on business books, self-help books, not so much fiction or biography but we can talk about what those need to do in the future. But let's just look at business and self-help. With these books, you read a book, you say, okay, this is great, this is so useful, but then you forget it two weeks after you finish the book. Not helpful. And in fact, where did you read the book? Probably sitting on your couch. Where do you need to use the book? Probably somewhere else. I have networking tips in my book. You don't use those networking tips on your couch you're probably using them when you're out at an event. Mm -hmm. So the problem is books are disconnected spatially and temporally from when we need the content within them. That's a problem. Now we want people to remember what's in them. And we know there's a proven technique for doing this called space repetition. It's a fancy name for open your book again before the test. And that's what we did in school. Mm -hmm. We'd reread the book, we'd look at our yeah. notes, we'd use flashcards. <laughs> But no one does that for books they read. I happen to take notes on books I read, but I'm kind of different that way. But I even rarely look back at them. So I thought, what if we could take the key ideas in the book, the highlights, key tips, put those into an app that's in your pocket. This makes the content accessible to the user when and where they need it. Now, even then, they might not think to access it. So my networking tips, they might think I'm walking into a networking event. Let me open the app, pull up Mark's tips. Great. And you get just in time. Perfect. But what about I'm trying to be a better leader? Okay. There's no moment where I say in the middle of a meeting, wait, time out, everyone. I've got to pull out <laughs> this app and look up a tip for what to do. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work that way. Instead, you need to just keep these things top of mind. So the app is designed that does a daily push notification at a time you set with one of the tips. So for example, if you're a new manager, you might set it to get management tips. And then at 9 a.m. as you walk into the office, you get a management tip each day. You look at, it takes two seconds, you swipe it away, but it's reminded you, it stays top of mind. Or you can save that tip if you want to come back to it later as a favorite. 
And so what the app does, it takes content from books, blogs, classes, podcasts, and talks, takes the key points, the highlights that the content creators put in there and makes them accessible to the user when and where the user wants it. Okay, so specific to my area of expertise and what I'm doing is podcasting. You mentioned you've been on many podcasts. How, I'm curious, because there's going to be a lot of my friends and uh, co-podcasters that are going to have this question. How does this pull information from a podcast into the app? That's really interesting to me. We leave it to the content creator to decide what goes in. One of the things I found during research, there are some similar apps out there, book summary apps, for example. Now with the book summary app, the summary app creators go out, they find books, read them, summarize them, put in the book without any permission from the author. There's two problems with this. First, I heard a lot of authors say, you know, they didn't quite get it right. They, they're not expressing my ideas right. That hurts their brand. Because I think, oh, okay, I, I get it. I've looked at the summary. I know what this person's talking about. But no, I don't. They got it wrong. Second, most people who just read the book summary say, okay, you know, done. I got the summary. I don't need the book. Mm-hmm. We want to work with the content creator and support them and not just take from them. So the content creator determines how much goes into the app. They pick what they want. For most podcasters, it's actually pretty easy because a lot of podcasters, for each episode, they might pull out a quote and use it as a social media post. You might take, for example, the publication of your book is the starting line, not the finish line. So you might post up there. They're right there. There's a tip from this podcast. And that would be a tip. You take another 20 seconds to take what you're going to post on Twitter or Instagram, also add it to the server. And now you've got your content there as well, ready to go into the app. So you decide what goes in. Now, the great thing that we do that doesn't happen on social media, there's a few things. First, ours will link back to the episode. That does happen on social media. So someone can say, okay, hey, I like that quote. I like that idea. I want to hear more. And they'll click into the episode to learn more about it. But here's the other thing. When you post that on social media, so let's say you post that next week. Someone might be thinking, oh, yeah, I'm I'm getting close to publishing my book. That's a good thing to remember. Someone else might not be in the book mindset, and they're just going to ignore that particular quote. It's not relevant to them. And it disappears into the ether. Five months from now, they don't dig through your past social media posts to find what might be relevant. But... With Brain Bump, unlike social media, this will get surfaced because it's designed for evergreen content. And someone who says, I need advice on books, they're going to see this tip. It is relevant to them because they pull content that's relevant instead of having the content creator push out and hope it's relevant. So your content, once added, becomes immediately relevant to different people forevermore. And that generates a lot more value to both the user who's pulling just in time when it's relevant and to the creator who knows their content will always be relevant to the reader. Is there a, um, a value attributed to the recency of content, meaning that something that I do today is more relevant than maybe something I did two years ago? Because I'm thinking sometimes something that happened two years ago could be really relevant being evergreen that I would like people to see. So I would kind of like a balance from my perspective of recency and a past library. This is a new app. So right now it is flat in that all content is equal. For podcasts, unlike books, we have the concept of a date with a tip because your book, tips for your book, well, they're all just from the book. You can list your publication date, but it's gonna be the same for all tips. Podcasts, however, to your point, a tip from this episode happened at a different time than a tip from two years prior, and you can include the date. The algorithm right now doesn't distinguish between that, but in the future will allow the user to say, maybe the user wants something that is only from the last six months and not from any time, and will give the user that option. But unlike social media, social media is very temporal. Social media says, recency, recency, recency. That's all that matters. 
And we don't do that because it means all the effort you did this past year to get content out there, that's faded. But with Brain Bump, once you put the content there, it is equally valuable to the end user and gets surfaced as such. Okay, that's, I like that. Are people following topics and information or are they following creators on, on the app? We're seeing some of both. Okay. It's still very early. I don't think we have enough data, okay. but to your point, it's designed. So when you open the app, you'll see different content sets, books, blogs, podcasts, and you can certainly add it. We have some people who have a book with a corresponding podcast, for example. Others may only have their book or only have their podcast. But then people will typically download two, three, four pieces of content, similar usually by topic. They might say, you know what? I want those leadership tips. And I don't care if it's your book or her blog or his podcast. And so we allow them to access by topic and not just only things from this book versus that podcast. They can say, I want things by topic. We support effectively hashtags. We don't use a hashtag symbol, but tagging of the topics to let people find things that are relevant to their needs at that moment. Okay. So this is, I'm picturing like a, a big buffet of all this stuff that you can choose from. And if you only like steak or you only like potatoes, we're going to serve you potatoes or steak. It is going to be tailored to what serves you as an end user. Um, from from an end user perspective, has there been any feedback coming back to you about what they like and maybe what things you, they would like to see the app do? There's a number of things, and we have a long roadmap of things that we're going to support in the future. We're early in this process. One of the big things, and now we're recording this at the beginning. Excuse me, at the beginning of September. Mm -hmm. One thing that's rolling out next week, and we're still pre-launch, by the way, it will be end of September, early October that we really go public with this. So if you're listening to this episode before then, you're getting a sneak preview. Oh, nice. But one of the things that we were told is content sharing on social media is big. And so what we've done, we have currently in the app at the time we're recording, you can share the text. And within a week, so by mid-September we will support a visual, an image share of the content. So what does that mean? If you think about a tool like Canva, Canva lets you take an idea, often people take some quote, some idea of theirs, they put in Canva and they make a pretty background and then they can post it to social media and get something very pretty and shareable. We build that in. Now we're not as feature rich as Canva, you can pick what background colors you want. You can pick the font size and adjust it so it all looks nice. And it will automatically have the cover image associated where that quote came from. If it came from this podcast, it would have your podcast cover image. If it came from my book, it will have my book cover image. But here's the thing, unlike Canva, we actually give you the content because you're looking at the tips. And so as you look at any tip, you can say, hey, I love this idea. I want to share it with my friends, with my followers. And in fact, a lot of content creators, it, I didn't even think about this when I first did, but they really clamored and said, this is what we want. There's a rule in social media called the 60-30-10 rule. And the rule says 60% of the content you share should be your own. Here's what I'm thinking about. Here's an article. Here's me on a podcast. 30% should be from other people. Hey, here's an article, not that I wrote, someone else wrote, but I think you'd like it. Here's an idea from someone else. And you're, you're being generous and you're promoting other ideas. And then 10% is, hey, look at me and buy my stuff. So 60, 30, 10 rule. 30%, roughly a third needs to be other content. Every third day, some other content, which means we're always struggling to say, what, what can I share? What's relevant? I have to go find something. Now, what if you had something like, Bartlett's book of quotations for the digital age. And that's what this is. Because if you're saying, I happen to be a communication expert, okay, I, I need, I haven't posted something in two or three days, open up the app, pull down the content that you want, find something with the tag communication or sharing or teamwork or whatever is the appropriate tag for you. And there's a whole bunch of quotes, a whole bunch of ideas that are on topic and relevant for your audience. 
and then you just click share on social media. So within seconds, we can help you find and share content relevant for your audience that will supplement your own content so you're not just looking selfish. And we make this easy. So we're like a Canva, but for your content. Mm. Well, I think I'm going to perk up a few ears just by saying that. I love that. Um, Mark, the one thing that I've seen some great apps in my in my past and love them, get in there, start sharing, start doing all the things. And they're free apps. And being a free app, they don't have any advertisements. They don't have any income. And eventually they just don't exist. And it's sad because they do, they fill a gap. They fill a need. Um, but there's got to be a way to generate income to support all of the great things you're doing with the app. Kind of what is the, maybe a little behind the scenes, is there going to be a paid version of this? Is there going to be um, people buying ad space within the app? How are you funding this so that you can have this long term for our benefit? Right now I'm doing it all out of pocket. You're right. Eventually I need revenue coming in from it. Thankfully, having done tech startups for a couple decades, I'm quite familiar with how to do it, how to think about revenue models, knowing how long I can delay that. I will say a few things. There will always be a free version of the app. I do not want to sell people's data. And I would like to avoid advertising if possible or have very limited effort. I don't want people to, in the middle of this, start to just see ads unexpectedly. No yeah. one wants that. So those are some of the constraints, but there are other revenue models that work. And so that's what I'm going to be developing over the coming years. But most importantly, before thinking of revenue, it's about thinking of value. And I need to make sure I'm delivering value to the app users that you're saying, this is good content and I can access it. And I like how I use this and that it's providing value to the content creators who say, we want to keep putting our content on here. Once I do that, monetization won't be an issue. Yeah, even in a simple thing as an affiliate program that as podcasters, we can promote because what I'm listening to and what I'm hearing from other podcasters is that struggle with paying for hosting fees, paying for equipment, paying for guests and all that other stuff. And that all costs money. And so now we're getting an influx of commercials into our podcast, which as a listener kind of makes some people not that interested in our content anymore because there's 10 minutes of commercials in a 30 minute episode. It's like skip, 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 skip on their app because they don't even want to hear the commercials. So that's my, my big concern is that, that a great app like this would just how it's going to be funded for the long term sense, because this is, this sounds like something that I could use today to help promote and build my audience, build my community. And it, yeah, even if there's like an affiliate program where we can promote it and share it, that's not what this is right now. This is a great conversation, but I would love to have some kind of way of pointing people towards the app as well and give our recommendations as creators. Well, in fact, one of the great things for content creators is we provide a lot of tools for you to go out and promote your content on the app. If you think about the app store, there's literally millions of apps. So when Apple says, hey, everyone, go to the app store. Okay, that's great. But the odds that they go and find your app is pretty slim. As we grow, content creators can't just rely on, well, people will show up and find me. They need to promote their content on the app, just like you have to promote your book on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And so we'll do general promotion, but content creators will promote their content. We provide a number of tools to make it very easy that people can just click a link or snap a QR code and instantly get your content on their app. And so what that does is it helps them continue to engage with you and your brand, even once they stop listening to that episode or close the cover on the book, they're still engaging with your content and they're getting value and you're getting value. And that's what we're designed to do. So the tips that we create for the app, are we creating the tips in the app or are we bringing our created tips to the app? You can do it either way. Okay. So certainly as, for example, you create a new episode 
and you create that quote in your Instagram post, you can quickly click in and within about 20 seconds, add that to the server, which will then be available to users of the app. But often people have a big back catalog, scores, hundreds of episodes, and we create a way for you to do it offline and then just upload that content to the server. Okay, so I'm looking at a tip right now from this great book called The Career Toolkit Blog. Oh, it's from the blog. It says, what can you offer that helps people individually? See, right there. So I'm already checking out some tips from, from the app. It's, it's really interesting. I, I, like, I like how it works. I like how it flows. And um, I, again, so you can, you can like it. You can share it right from the app as well. And that would go out to the, to the connected social media platforms to your own personal account. Exactly. When you hit the share button, whether the one you're looking at right now is how to share the app. So your friend, hey, I've got this great app. You should check it out. Or if you want to share a specific tip, once you hit that share button, then it just connects like everything else. And do you want to share to your social media or Instagram or email or whatever apps are on your phone? But now the app, the tip you read. So there's two ways to really think about using the content. One is I read that blog post, I heard that podcast episode, I read the book, and I want to remember some of these ideas. So I'm going to go back and keep pulling out those ideas to help me retain it. The other might be, you know, I haven't read this blog post yet. I haven't heard that episode or podcast, but let me look through where are the tips, where are the things they talk about? Do I like what I'm seeing? And if so, okay, you know what? I am going to subscribe to that podcast or start reading that blog. So I think the primary usage will be for I've seen that content, I've heard that content, I want to retain it. But there is also an element of discovery of new content. So we'll see both modes of use. What are What is uh, maybe a tip or two that you could share with content creators that are coming to the app, to come into BrainBump? How can we be successful as a content creator on the app to leverage everything that's built in? Because I'm sure there's going to be Again, there's probably more things coming in the future, but right now in the current way it is, how can I leverage every little ounce of this app to help support my content? Great question. There's a couple different things you can do. First, have good quality tips. Now, not every tip is going to be a brilliant insight, but you generally want good quality. If they're just banal, trite sayings, people won't want them. So create good quality content get that on the app, sell it to your audience. And by sell it, obviously no money is exchanged here, but get your audience to use it. This is to help your audience continue to engage with your content. And your audience, they're the people who already know you. They know your content's valuable and this helps them retain it. If you think about word of mouth marketing, and this is one of the things that went into my thinking of this, what you can't do word of mouth marketing for a book or a podcast you forgot. Mm -hmm. You read that book a year ago, how likely is it you're recommending it to someone if you forgot it? But if you're getting reminded of it every day, you're far more likely to recommend it to other people. So start with your audience and make sure they engage with your content through the app. Use the social share to share your content and also other people's content that's similar to yours that would resonate with your audience and share those ideas. We've even had content creators say, hey, you know, I'm seeing other content on here that's relevant. And they've asked me, can you put me in touch with this other person? I'm happy to connect people. Because if you had a leadership book and I have a leadership book, sure, we'll promote our content to our audience by a certain point. Hey, I really like your stuff. You know, I'm gonna promote some of your quotes, your ideas to my audience. Can you do the same for mine if you like what you're seeing? And we can cross promote and help each other. One of the really cool ways to use it, and this is used by a lot of speakers. Now, many authors and some podcasters as well also do speaking. They get brought into companies, they speak at conferences. Some people do it for free, some are paid. It might, it depends where you are in your speaking career. Now we have on our final slide, there's always that last slide where we say, thank you and here's my contact information. Here's my email. Here's my URL, you know, reach out if you have any questions. Okay, great. My slide, I have that, but I also put 
a QR code for my content. Each content on the app, so my book, my blog, your podcast, her talk, they each get a unique URL and corresponding QR code. So I take the QR code for, for example, my book, which is usually what my talks are on. And at the end I say, by the way, do you want to remember everything that we just talked about in the last hour? Because how often do we go to a talk and you're like, oh, there's so much, I can't keep it all. Yeah. They pull out your phones, snap this QR code. And when they snap the code, it lets them download the app and then they can add my content with just a snap of their camera. So it's just a few seconds and now they've added it and now they get reminded of the content each day that helps them retain it. And what went from, okay, I spent an hour, I listened, hopefully I'll remember and get something out of it to now I can retain a lot more because I'm not just seeing it once and forgetting it, but it's being repeatedly brought to my attention. They get so much more value out of it. They get a great benefit. Usually the person who brought me in loves me because she says everyone loves your content because they keep talking about it. And it's a simple thing with a QR code that we give you for having your content on the app. So there's all sorts of tiny little simple things that have huge impact. Have you had anybody come to you in the early stages of the app and give you a suggestion and you're like, wow, that's great. Let's do that. That's that's a great idea. We're going to put that in there. Anything that kind of caught you off guard and you're like, gee, that's a win. Let's try it. I'm trying to think nothing that's in there yet. Okay. I would say, well, podcasts, actually, when I first built the app, I was thinking of books. Okay, this will work for books. And I was talking to a podcaster and she said, could this work for podcasts? I hadn't even thought of it. I thought, wait, why not? There's good content in podcasts as well. And so we add podcasts. So what began just for books, we now support podcasts, blogs, talks, and classes. So I, I suppose mm. not necessarily a feature, but it's okay. support for a type of content. It's amazing. It's really great. So, Mark, when did all this start for BrainBub? How, how old is this? I had put out a prototype version last year, a version I did for my book that was just only dedicated to my book's content. It didn't have all the bells and whistles. That was a proof of concept to see how it worked, to see would users download, would they keep using it? And the answer is yes, they would. So once that proved it out, at the beginning of this year, I began to build this. And so I spent a number of months building it. We then got held up by some of the app stores, which if you ever build an app, just know it's going to be more painful than you thought trying to get <laughs> into some of the app stores. Once I got through the app stores, then we did have additional features we thought about adding. I want to make sure we added more content. So I mentioned right now we're recording in September and we're not launching to the end of the month. If you're launching Netflix, you can't launch Netflix with three shows because no one's going to say, oh, Netflix, I want to keep subscribing to this. You're going to look at three shows, say I don't like any of them and give up. Yeah. When we came into the app store, I had about six pieces of content. That was just my early content from people I called. We weren't even promoting it yet. I then went out and spoke to podcasters I knew, authors I knew, bloggers I knew, and reached out and said, hey, I think your content would work really well on here. And once the word got out, people started calling in saying, hey, I heard about this. I'm interested in getting my content on there. So we're launching at the end of this month, beginning of October, now that we have enough content that it feels rich, that there's something there. If someone shows up, they don't like this podcast or that book, there's plenty of other options. And of course, we'll continue to add content as we go. I think, now I'm going back in my memory, so please forgive me if I'm saying this incorrectly, but wasn't there some kind of little Easter egg that you planted into the uh, app for people on their phone, something to do with what they do with their phone and they do a certain action and something might happen? Is that sound like something we talked about? There, There is an Easter egg in there. Do I want to reveal the Easter egg? Mm, okay, well, maybe we, well, we'll just yeah. say, figure it out. <laughs> as a user you I'll, figure it out I'll, and let I'll us know say, I'll, I'll just say it has me all shook up oh okay well there you go that's a pretty good clue 
<laughs> putting you on the spot. I remember having this conversation. And I'm like, wait, did we say that it was okay to chat about that? But I'm not sure. But yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, what excites you about the app that's coming that you you were allowed to speak about? But what excites you for the long term uh, trajectory for the app? Where do you want it to go? And how deep do you want it to go? I guess is the other thing. Because I hear people say you can be a mile wide and an inch deep or a mile deep and an inch wide. Like, where do you kind of see this going? What you think will serve your users the best for the app in the future? In the next few months, it's about content okay. because we're launching with dozens of pieces of content, but the more content, the better for everyone. So it continues to add more content. I'll then have to update the UI. The UI right now, specifically the UI for finding content, the library page where you can find and add content, that's designed for dozens of pieces, 100, 200 pieces. It's not going to scale for 1,000 pieces. So as we start to add more content, I'll have to update that UI to make it easier. And people should feel free to send your thoughts on that. We do have some designs for future UI. We didn't want to do the more enhanced UI because there'd be a lot of blank spots. There'd be a lot of things where you're looking and saying, well, we just don't have the content yet. So that's why we're starting with the simpler one. But give us your thoughts. We're going to continue to add content and enhance the UI to support a larger content set. And then the content itself, right now we're launching generally with a business focus. We don't yet have, for example, marriage advice. That's not our current focus at this time in the fall of 2022. But very quickly, we're going to expand to that towards the end of 2022, early 2023. We're going to expand to other categories. And of course, we'll have to update the UI to support an interface for going, well, now I see one thing on marriage and another thing on funding a startup. And why are they next to each other? So I have to support better filtering for that. So that will be probably over the next six months or so where our focus is. And then going on to 2023, more functionality, more types of community support. And I'm very excited about uh, what that will bring. So for a, from a podcast lens, are you looking then for podcasters that are in that business and self-care, self, self-help self um, avenue and not really looking at other podcasters at the moment? Is that correct then? I would say if you are a podcaster or author or blogger or other person with content, reach out to me. If you've got a business book, for example, a business podcast, yeah, we'll get you on today. If you're about, let's say, parenting, okay, that might be in about three or four months. But reach out today because we'll get you queued up, we'll get you ready, and we just won't have your content live. So you can either wait a few months, I'll put you on the list, and then we'll let you know, okay, ready to go. You can even start to get your content ready if you want. So as soon as we're ready, your content is there and goes live. And now one thing I didn't mention, the current interface, one of the things about it, by default, we display content in the order in which it's added to the app. What this means is that people who get their content on earlier will be viewed more often because it's earlier in the list people scroll through, and that will lead to likely more engagement. And of course, once we add things like leaderboards, well, who do you think are going to be at the top of leaderboards? The people who got on soonest. That's going to create a virtuous cycle where they're the more popular content, they get more downloads, and that keeps them popular. So there's some incentive for people to get on earlier because that's going to move them to the top of what's effectively a new platform for media. Excellent. And for people that have multi things, like for me, I have six podcasts that I do every week in different topics. So for me, if I sign in and I start submitting to brain bump am i submitting would it be better for me to submit as six different people for the different topics or one person with six different categories you would likely have six different brands so for example one person she has a book a blog and a podcast so she has three pieces of content and that will, depending on what you want, you might say, I want all three. You might say, I only care about stuff from her podcast. I don't want stuff from her book. So the app user can decide. Now, in your case, you have six podcasts. 
but they are on different topics. Yeah. And so someone, if I remember right, I think you have one on parenting, for example. Yeah, dad space. Am I remembering yep. correctly? Yeah, that's right. So if someone might say, hey, I'm a book author. I really want to learn these ideas. I'm not so interested in your parenting tips because I'm not a parent or vice versa. Yeah. And we don't want to have the end user just get overwhelmed. Now, again, even within something, you know, if you have your parenting app and so, or your parenting podcast, someone says, yes, I want the parenting advice. You might even within the tips, you might tag things, for example, infants, newborns, toddlers, you know, different levels. And I might say, OK, well, I'm a father of a toddler. I only want toddler tips right now. And of course, I can use the filtering of the tips to select only toddler tips. So I can narrow it down from there, but I don't even want to bother with the author stuff if I'm just looking for parenting. Yeah. So I would keep it as six different pieces of content, each with their tip sets underneath. Okay. And so I, I don't think we really covered it in detail, but for a new creator that wants to come on to Brain Bump, what's the onboarding process? How do we how do we get our stuff and get into the app and be one of those uh, beginning pioneers on the app? How do we do that? You can go to my website, cognoscomedia.com, C-O-G-N-O-S-C-O media.com. And if you go to one of the Brain Bump links up top, you've got Brain Bump instructions or Brain Bump app, click one of those. You'll see down on the page, content creators apply here. And you just fill out a quick form. It'll take you 60 seconds. That's how you tell me you're interested. You'll tell me a little about your content. Give me your URL. And I'll then get in touch with you. We'll have a conversation about it. Everything's fully documented, but we're still early. I like to talk to people, both to make sure they understand what's involved. Also, because I do get ideas. Because in that conversation, you might say, hey, what about this? I go, oh, that's a good idea. We'll add it to our roadmap. So I'll have a quick conversation with you. It takes about 15 to 25 minutes, and then you're good to go. Amazing. Well, you're going to see a notification from me coming up real soon because I want to get on here and, and get my feet wet and get going in this. It's really exciting. Um, so again, the book, uh, really great. The Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success that No One Taught You. And uh, again, we'll put all the links to Brain Bump. We'll put the links to your website, everything in the show notes as well. Uh, what's exciting you before we close off? In in the future for content creation and for content creators, with Brain Bump in mind, what what excites you and where do you think we're headed? I hear we hear talk of podcasting is going to end up on YouTube. We're hearing all kinds of interesting things about the space, and uh, we all want to grow our communities. We all want, all want to supply great content to our communities. I think Brain Bump's going to really help. But what excites you down the road? You're in the space, so. I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on what's coming in general terms, what you're excited about. Brain Bump represents the future of digital media. And I don't try to say that out of arrogance. I think it's a tiny, tiny step and there will be people taking it much further. But as I mentioned earlier, we need to take content that traditionally was between the covers of our book and then put that content into a place when and where people can access it that's relevant for our readers. Now, I said book and readers, but really it's, we're not authors, we're not podcasters, we are content creators and they are content consumers. And so we need to take what has been linear content, a book, a movie, a podcast, and really rethink its structure and rethink its delivery, which we can do with digital tools to allow for content to be engaged in the most useful fashion to the content consumer. That's a long-term future. Sure, we'll put, we'll put podcasts on YouTube. We also went from print books to digital books and digital to audio. That's not interesting. That's just a medium transformation, but it is about content transformation, about moving from a linear to a non-linear experience, and that is the future of media. No, love it, Mark. That's a great way to end. Really, really exciting. Um, it's got to be, I, I would love to spend a week just following you around and see what you're up to because this, to be able to create something like this to help people and to see this kind of created and now out there, 
And uh, it just it seems like such a great platform for creators. And I feel blessed that I get a chance to talk to you in the early stages. And just to encourage you that this is something that I've seen a gap from my side of the microphone. So I'm so happy to see that there's someone doing something about it and taking steps to help us uh, to get our message out. So thank you for doing that. It's, it's amazing. You're quite welcome. I saw starting with books, once the book was closed, you lost the connection between the author and the reader. Podcasters, there's no way to promote your podcast other than social media or buying ads. There's really nothing out there that gets you outside of the episodes to connect with your audience. So there's a huge gap in multiple channels for multiple types of content creators to continue to engage and help the content consumer continue to grow. And I was shocked when I first came up with this idea, I thought, okay, someone must've built this. I'm just gonna go find the tool. I'm gonna license it for my book. And it did not exist. So I spent time thinking about, it. we have a patent pending on the technology, and now we have the app out there for people to use. Be a great tool for authors as well. So if you're listening to the podcast and you're an author, here you go, you gotta check it out. You gotta go talk to Mark. He's gonna set you up and help you on your path. Again, Mark, I'm, I'm so thrilled to, to have time with you and I really appreciate you being so generous with your time. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you so much for being here with us today again. Thank you for subscribing and following. And you're listening this far in the podcast, so you are my best friend. I'm sorry, but you are now my best friend. So welcome. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Uh, LivingTheNextChapter.com has a link on the website to our Facebook group. Are you on Facebook? Probably. Uh, you can go there and you can actually interact with our guests. You can talk to them. You can hear more about their journey, about their books. You can speak to them directly. You don't need me. You can come right over to livingthenextchapter.com. Click on our Facebook link to our community. You can talk to other listeners of the podcast from around the world who are on Facebook. And again, speak with our guests. Don't you want to speak to the guests you just heard from? Yeah, you can do that on Living the Next Chapter. Go over there. There's links to our Facebook group, and you're welcome to join. Thanks for listening.